I'm very excited for our afternoon program. We actually have two panels, and I'm going to start by introducing our speakers in the first panel and turn it over to them, and then I'll introduce our panel, um, our, our speakers from the second panel. Um, so our first panel is on authentic assessments in interpsychology. Um, we have a few speakers here. The first is going to be um, Karen Brocky, who's a professor of psychology and co-director of Teaching Resource and Research Center at Spelman College. Karen has authored several publications relevant to teacher teaching, learning, and college life. She's highly engaged in the psychology teaching community, and she currently serves as co-chair of the APA Committee on Associate and Baccalaureate Education. I get to work with her in that context. Wonderful. Um, she's also an organizer of the Southeastern Teaching of Psychology Conference and uh, was a member of the planning committee for this um, IP Course Design Institute. Uh, so we'll hear from Karen first. After Karen, we'll hear from Janelle Ka Cavazos. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Janelle is an associate professor and master teacher in the Department of Psychology at the University of Oklahoma, um, down the street where I used to be at Oklahoma State. She's in uh, University of Oklahoma. She is the Introductory Psychology Program Coordinator, uh, where she teaches an average of 1,500 students a year and supervises sections of intro psych taught by graduate students and conducts a mentor program for teaching. Um, Janelle emphasizes area, uh, her areas of emphasis include curriculum development, the implementation of technology in the classroom, and program assessment. And her research focuses on the scholarship of teaching and learning and the impact of mental imagery on study habits and memory. We're also going to hear from uh, Carolyn Brown Kramer, who's an associate professor of practice at the University of Nebraska. She teaches large sections of introductory psychology, as well as social psych, advanced social psych, and motivation. And um, Carolyn really believes in closing the loop of scholarly teaching by conducting research within her classes and then using those findings to inform future class iterations. Carolyn is also a member of the planning committee for this IP Course Design Institute. So I'm so grateful uh, to have them here. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Karen to start us off. Hi, everybody. I just had to figure out how to unmute once I started sharing. It's good to see everyone here. All right. So um, as Sue mentioned, I'm the current co-chair of the Committee for, on Associate and Baccalaureate Education, or CAVE for IPI. And um, rather than talking about an example like the other panelists are going to do, uh, we thought this would be a good place where I could talk about some of the resources. We've been mentioning resources, resources, resources throughout the Institute. Um, you know, we talk about uh, authentic assessment today. So I just wanted to highlight some of the resources um, that we at CAVE um, have pulled together, um, curated, particularly for intro psych and incorporating authentic assessment. So, if I can. Um, so again, CAVE is a committee. We're, we're part of the APA um, government structure. We represent undergraduate education at both the associate and baccalaureate um, levels. And it's a really neat committee to be on. I'll just put in a plug here because we get to take a look at what's happening in psychology, higher education, and we get to say, hey, you know, it would be a good idea if we could do this or we could do that. And um, so, you know, here's here's our official mission, but really we just advocate and work on behalf of undergraduate education. And just to let you know some of the things that have originated with CABE ideas um, and, and different committee members saying, hey, can we do this? APA, can we make this happen? <laughs> Include project assessment and the introductory psychology initiative, which by now you have all heard of. Um, as well as the skillful psychology student, which talks about transferable skills that psychology majors learn. It's a nice little one page document to hand out to your students so that they not only learn the skills, but they know that they learn the skills. Um, we also do a couple of awards and we encourage you to apply for the Teaching Resources Award. We are just getting ready to update our call for that. If you've got a neat assignment or assessment idea thing that you do, um, and would like to um, share it and even have it uh, part of project assessment in that um, set of, of 
uh, assignments. We encourage you to um, submit that assignment and apply for this award. There is cash associated with it as a little incentive, and those are due November 1st. As well, the Student Essay Award is a relatively new one where we ask students to say, how does psychology help you in your career preparation and your career plans. That also is due November 1st. So we hope that you will share that with your students because there is cash available there as well. Um, so for today, we have curated a list of resources. This document is in the repository and rather than skipping back and forth between screens, I just have a screenshot of the first page here. I think it's about four pages long. It includes books, articles, um, websites and other resources that um, are particularly, I think, we think, particularly helpful for introductory psychology and authentic assessment. And, and what I'm going to do today, just real quickly, is highlight some of the ones um, that, you know, if you can't look at them all, here are some really, really good ones to look at. Of course, the IPI website. All right, you are all here because you're in teaching intro, you're interested in IPI. The website has the, the pillars where with the different areas, the organization, it has videos about the ideas. It even has some example um, instructional materials, modules of, to kind of inspire you to how you can create things that are compatible with the you know, IPI mission. So please do check that out. Um, these slides, I think, will be available in the repository also. And if you go to the slide deck, um, a real easy thing to do is just click on the title of each one and it will take you. So I have them active links within the PowerPoint as well, as well as on the um, sheet um, that's in there. Regan Garung, who um, is one, was one of the, the co-leaders of the initiative, has really done a lot um, while we're gearing up the implementation um, aspects at the APA level. He's really done a lot to um, keep the community going, start building the community for introductory psychology. And he's created the hub for introductory psychology. You can find it on Facebook as a Facebook group. It's very active. And he's also got a, a website here um, for introductory psychology and pedagogical, re pedagogical research. Um, so it not only has readings and ideas and resources for teaching intro psych, but that all important step of the scholarship of teaching and learning. Can we get evidence? Can we get data uh, on how intro psych initiative principles and processes are working? So if you're interested in collecting data, he's got scales, he's got um, ways to connect with collaborators, literature, and so forth. So excellent site there. Again, specific developed in specifically with IPI in mind. Um, of course, many of you know about teachpsych.org. I mentioned it here in case you don't know about it, you need to. It's the Division II Society for Teaching Psychology um, resources, all sorts of wonderful resources from syllabi to assignments to um, eBooks, lots of eBooks to look through. So again, peruse that um, and become a member if you're not a member too, because that, that opens up some additional things for you. All right. Um, and I'm just going through these quickly with the idea that you can browse on your own time because we want to get to um, Janelle and Carolyn as quickly as possible. Um, so APA Education Directorate, which Cabe, um, is the liaison office, which is the office Sue and Martha work for, also have their own page um, with all sorts of links and guides in it, and certainly worth looking through at an APA level. This document, I think, is in the repository, but I'll mention it here. Assessment Cyber Guide, we're kind of morphing into assessment now, not just with intro psych, but for all of your courses. And then the high school assessment guide um, is a similar a document that talks about all sorts of principles and practices of assessment that are good for us to know. And I want to step to some outside resources as well. We're talking about authentic assessment today. 
So this is a really great um, site. As you see, Authentic Assessment Toolbox by John Mueller. And he covers all the basics, has, it's very accessible, has all sorts of resources here. So if you're tackling that issue of authentic assessment, um, this is an excellent page as well. And again, please, please come back to these. I'm just highlighting them, make a note for the ones that you wanna come back to. There's also these things called books, <laughs> um, and, which you can find online too now, but um, you know we don't wanna forget about them. Um, these are four books here that I find particularly helpful. Um, the first one, and if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about each one because these you have to make a little more effort and maybe pay some money for. So I wanna talk a little bit about each one. Um, Angelo and Cross, this is the classic of all sorts of different kinds of classroom assessment techniques. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's classic now as in 1993, but it's still considered a fantastic resource to just go through and, and get all sorts of ideas and be creative with your assessments. And they actually have the first edition available as a PDF online for free now. And so that is worth looking at just to see what the possibilities are. Of course, the IPI, Transforming Introductory Psychology um, book is out that has everything we're talking about um, in this uh, workshop, um, or at least some parts of this workshop. We actually have a little more on, on, on some, some aspects of it, but it, it lays out the findings and recommendations of IPI very clearly and has a lot of different examples of how it can work in different institutions. And then the last two really have to do with assessment and authentic assessment. Um, Joe Mayo's book, Constructing Undergraduate Psychology Curricula, has some great um, different kinds of assessment and talks about how you align things within your classes and between classes within the curriculum. So you, it's really actually a construct, literally constructive, constructivist approach to um, creating learning in psychology. And this last one I've sort of fell in love with just this summer. Um, I think his name is pronounced McTeague. McTeague. Um, he's done a lot of writing. It's aimed at K for K-12 um, assessment. Um, this latest book, Designing Authentic Performance Tasks and Projects, um, I find is a fantastic how-to guide for authentic assessment, for designing rubrics, for thinking about how to use formative and summative assessment. It's got some nice theoretical basis to it, very um, written, very straightforward. I really am now using that as my handbook um, for doing authentic assessment. It's written for K-12, but totally applicable to what we're doing. Okay. And of course, um, there's all sorts, you know, you can't list all the resources. There's all sorts of websites that have lists of other resources or that have ideas for you. Um, teaching and learning journals have, are full of ideas. If you can get hold of those and subscribe or join division two, and you'll get teaching of psychology as, as part of your membership. Peers, the psychology teaching community is wonderful. Um, you are now part of that just by attending this workshop. And if, if you have a chance to go to the meeting, the con any of the conferences, the regional conferences or national ones, the, those are listed in the um, document that I showed at the beginning of the slides, please do. You can establish communities of practice. There is a brand new um, APA intro site community, as well as the summer Institute for or Intro Psychology Planning hosted by Regan. Um, or you can even create your own social media group with, with local people or, or other people um, um, who you know, your own network. But this kind of community is, is one of the best source of ideas and inspiration. So if you're not tapped in, um, that's a good idea. And as a director of a teaching and learning center, I also have to put in a plug for your institutional teaching and learning center. Um, we are here to help you. This is what we love is designing assessments, designing courses, making sure everything aligns. So please, please make use of your teaching and learning center um, as you can. 
And that was a whirlwind. Um, but I hope there's little one or two little nuggets in there that you'll find useful. And again, I encourage you to go back and just play and explore on your own. And I think I'm ready to turn it over to Janelle. Awesome. So um, I was already very kindly introduced. Thank you for that. Um, I am going to be presenting our very first uh, um, actual assessment type of assignment today um, that, that I have done some work on in my classes. I still assign it regularly in all of my classes. And the idea is to be able to have um, assessments that are, as we've talked about before, authentic, scalable, flexible, um, and, and of course that the students enjoy and learn from. So I'm gonna be talking about um, an assignment that's called Myth Busting with Infographics. Um, so the background on this is the importance of debunking myths that of course has been talked about repeatedly. I um, originally came up with this idea um, after attending a NITOP conference, which if you haven't been, you should definitely go. Um, it's the best conference ever, um, the National Institute for the Teaching of Psychology. And I uh, saw a wonderful talk by Doug Bernstein on um, Bye Bye Intro is what he called it. And he talked about um, revamping intro psychology to not be so much you know, content driven, content heavy, but really emphasizing the idea of the myths that we all sort of perpetuate or hear perpetuated in society regarding psychology and things that really help the students live their everyday lives. Um, and so I really took that to heart and, and got to thinking about ways that I could possibly um, use this idea of large myths and psychology um, in a way that, that could really help students in my introductory psychology classroom. So in the current assignment, the way that it works is that students create infographics um, that, that include, uh, they have to include evidence debunking the myth along with um, some things that show how the myth is actually perpetuated. Um, so the uh, the instructions uh, just as a whole, there's a, there's a big long thing of instructions, of course, because I, I like to do things um, in a lot of detail for the students because I just have so many and they're mostly freshmen. Um, but the assignment instructions are to pick one myth from a shortened greatest myths in psychology list. And I give them I give them about 10 or so myths that they can choose from. Um, and I, I originally got this list from the uh, from from the the 50 greatest myths book by Lillenfeld. And I kind of go through it for what I think are some things that we actually talk about in class, as well as things that just kind of come up a lot. If there's something that happens in the real world that a myth kind of addresses, I make sure to put that in. I change them every year, uh, and, and I do that to avoid students sort of borrowing from their roommates, borrowing from their friends. Um, they have to keep it sort of fresh. And so, so they have to pick one of these myths. Then they create an infographic related to the myth. And in that infographic, they have to include um, a description of the myth. They have to show a source or an example of how the myth is actually perpetuated in everyday life. So it can be... a, a, a talk show they heard or a news article or a BuzzFeed um, test or, you know, a, a, it could be a book or a movie, but just where have they heard the myth? How does, how is it still getting transmitted in everyday life? And then the big important part is that they have to, uh, they have to debunk the myth using three different sources and three different pieces of evidence. So they can't just say the same thing three times. Like my book says, it's not true. They have to actually, uh, they have to actually find information and show why the myth is false. And I'm very loose about the kinds of uh, academic sources they can use. Um, and I teach intro, they're all freshmen. Uh, I, I don't require that they use journal articles. They can use Science Daily or Discovery Health or things like that. Um, but they have to be, they have to be factual kind kind of sites. And the idea is they do something creative and debunk this myth that they're interested in. Um, so the, um, I don't know if I already said that, list has changed each year. So here's some student examples. And I know these are teeny tiny, but I know that you'll be able to download the slides. Um, so this one is opposites attract. Um, we hear this myth all the time that opposites attract, except we know it's not true. And so this student, of course, has, has explained the myth in their own words. You can see that um, they're, they're saying, here's what the myth actually is. And then they're using resources and evidence to show why that myth is false, 
studies, very briefly, studies that have talked about why the myth is false. Um, and in, as the example, they use Beauty and the Beast, which I love. Um, so they're talking about how different Belle and the Beast are, and that's our, our sort of stereotype of how people get together. Of course, it's not true. So they're going out and finding all this evidence themselves in order to debunk this myth. Um, and then another example is the good old, most people only use 10% of their brain myth. Um, I throw this in uh, pretty regularly because it's always a very, very, very popular one for them to do. And so again, they're explaining the myth itself. They're looking up factual information to show why the myth is false. Um, for example, you know, we can see in fMRI scans that more than 10% of your brain lights up. Again, it doesn't have to be complicated, but the idea is that they get to uh, they get to sort of explore resources on their own, put something together, be a little more creative with it. And it's not just another research paper that they have to write. Um, so that's the idea. Now, one of the things that I really love about the infographic idea as a whole is how adaptable it is. Um, I'm, using, I'm using it specifically in this context for men myths, but there are so many other ways that you can use infographics, including um, having students create an infographic to explain a theory. They could be presenting arguments for or against a specific viewpoint if you're talking about multiple theories in a class. Um, a public service announcement, I think this would be a great idea for a social site class, maybe um, convincing people of a certain viewpoint or talking about a certain cognitive bias. Um, Public uh, uh, outlining research studies, if you're in a research methods class, preparing for exams, there's just so many different ways that you can use infographics. And the students really enjoy this because, again, it's not your boring research study and they get to, it's not a paper, they get to show some of their um, some of their creativity, and they're all so unique that um, that they really get to show off their personalities, which I which I like a lot. So as far as um, the learning outcomes, um, I know that, that of course, this, this, um, this form, the idea is to use authentic assessment and have it match up with uh, the IPI objectives. And so there are, there are quite a few here that we can see that relate to this particular myth busting with infographics idea. They are, they're definitely having to interpret research findings because they're having to go out, read the research, um, and then figure out how it applies directly to that myth. And they're applying these psychology principles to things they see in everyday life, which is again, why they have to show me how the myth is perpetuated. They're seeing it around them. Um, and then they're using psychology, sci uh, psychology science in order to debunk that. Um, they are, they're having to draw conclusions about behavior and mental processes because they're using those resources to do that. They're looking at how psych science can be used to counter unsubstantiated claims or beliefs. That's exactly what the assignment does. And they're going to be able to use that later when they are, for example, arguing with their friends and saying, um, you know, I heard this, hey, we know that that's false because. So they're using evidence to be able to do that. Um, and as far as the key themes, it does depend on which myth they choose in particular, but um, they are absolutely able to see that, that data changes, data evolves, and that data can be found in a whole lot of everyday sources. Um, they're looking at how different factors influence mental processes. They're looking at perceptions and biases. So for example, how do we see it perpetuated? Um, where do we constantly hear this information that science knows is wrong, but refuses to sort of, we, we still perpetuate it every day. Um, and then the way that we can use these principles to actually change everyday life by convincing ourselves, and also of course the people around us, that these myths are, are false. And that is all I've got. So thank you very much. As Sue said, I'm Carolyn Brown Kramer. I'm with the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And I want to talk a little bit about some assessments that I use in my intro psych class that simultaneously are authentic assessments of student learning, but also um, build skills that are useful throughout the introductory psychology course. Um, so I want to start out with a simple and stop me if you've heard this one. Student comes up after an exam, says, I spent so much time studying for this exam and I did all of these behaviors and I still didn't achieve the grade that I wanted, whatever that grade was. Um, and so the question I always have for that student is, okay, well, tell me what you thought about while you were studying. And they usually give me this blank response, like, I looked at the book and I 
recopied my notes. What do you mean think about? Like, why should I care about what I think about? And I try to convey to them that that is the important thing that one does while studying. Like, that is the whole point of studying. And so often the response that I get is something like this. I've used these strategies, rereading and highlighting and flashcards. They got me through high school just fine. Why should I change something that's been very effective for me? And so my response is usually something along the lines of, was it effective for you on this exam? And is it going to continue to be effective in college, right? Where the content is harder, it's faster, um, it's more integrative. And, and I think probably key for a lot of students is that you're doing it on your own, right? It's not, the learning that you do in the classroom is a minority of the learning that you should be doing in the class. So it's much more on students to figure out or to develop effective learning strategies that they can use outside of the classroom. So that's really been um, the, the line of work that I've been doing over the last several years. So as it turns out, psychological scientists and cognitive scientists have done a lot of amazing, important, groundbreaking work to let us know what learning strategies are effective and what things are less effective. So um, among the leaders in this area is he and colleagues. And so there's this seminal paper 2013 and then a follow-up paper in 2015 that created this sort of paradigm of less useful, moderately useful, and highly useful learning strategies that people can use. So I'll just bust through these really quickly, um, and I'll have references at the end that people can go and look at the original papers if they're interested. Um, so low utility strategies, note these are not no utility strategies. Like they, they help some, but they're not they don't get a lot of bang for their buck. So students spend a lot of time using these strategies, but don't get much out of it. Or it's a quick and easy strategy, but it really doesn't do much for you. So things like highlighting or underlining the text, right? That's a very passive strategy. Um, imagery use for text learning. This would be, you read a text passage and you are instructed to visualize what it would look like or how it would work in real life. The keyword mnemonic is often used for vocabulary learning. So for instance, if I am learning Spanish and I see the word leer, which means to read, I might say leer, that kind of sounds like lay there. So I'm going to imagine somebody laying on a couch reading a book. So whenever I hear leer, I think lay there and I remember reading. So trying to associate keywords. Um, rereading the text, we know students spend a lot of time rereading. Uh, the, the thing about these low utility strategies is that they often produce a sense of confidence, right? They make students feel, oh, I've looked at the material several times, I got it, because they're nodding along with the book or nodding along with the recorded lecture or whatever. Um, but it's really quite passive. And then summarizing, so taking whatever it was that was in the lesson or the reading and recopying it out or summarizing it. So those things typically take a decent amount of effort and really very relatively low payout. Moderate utility strategies are things like elaborative interrogation. So this would be coming up with an explanation for why a fact or concept would be true. Explain it, right? Interrogate why that would be true. The second moderate utility strategy is interleaving. And this is basically uh, switching up the material that you're learning within a given study session. So you might spend a half an hour on math and then you'll spend a half an hour on Spanish and you'll spend half an hour on psychology instead of an hour and a half on psychology. So switching up the content or the, the method of learning within a given study session. And then self-explanation is basically thinking about how is this new material related to other information I already know or explaining your problem solving steps. So first I did this, then I did this, then I did that. So those are all reasonably useful strategies. Those are probably a pretty good use of your time. And then the high utility strategies over on the right-hand side are things like distributed practice or spaced practice. So you might study a little bit on Monday, study a little bit on Tuesday, study a little bit on Wednesday, instead of cramming before the big test all in one session. So that spaced practice is really helpful. Second high utility strategy is practice. So this would be, um, this could be an instructor-led practice test and the student gets feedback. This could be a self-quiz. Um, flashcards are actually can be a, a good method of practice testing. It really depends on exactly how the um, flashcards are used and set up. Uh, but those are really good strategies. That is a good bang for your buck. 
And then finally, the idea of success of learning, this is from the 2015 paper, um, that sort of combines the best of distributed practice and practice testing. So the idea of successive relearning is in a given session, you sit down and you do some practice testing until you've achieved whatever your benchmark is, right? I'm going to get uh, nine out of 10 correct. Then you go and you come back the next day and you practice again until you reach that benchmark and you leave and you come back the next day, right? So you're doing both distributed practice and practice testing over multiple sessions. Okay, so if you are like me and you have conversations with your students and you say, tell me how you study, you get a lot of answers in this, oh yeah, I use the low utility strategies and I don't really do a lot of these high utility strategies because they're harder, they're more time intensive. And it sometimes students get confronted with a lack of knowledge and they say, oh, I didn't know that as well as I wanted. Ugh, I don't like that feeling. So I'm going to go back to something that builds my confidence but unfortunately not necessarily my skill. So what I've done is over the last several years, taken these ideas into the, my classroom and the research that I do. My goal in all my <laughs> SOTL research, scholarship of teaching and learning research is to teach to learn better and then see how that affects their study skills and hopefully see how that affects their class performance for the better. So the basic framework that I use looks something like this. At the beginning of the semester, I give them a pre-survey. I say, tell me about your study strategies, right? I give them these 10, 11 different strategies. And I say, when do you use them? How do you use them? How often do you use them? Right, kind of get a baseline. Then there's content, there's an exam, more content, second exam. In the middle of the semester, I give them an essay. And this is, the, this is the key intervention that I do in the context of my intro site class. Um, I give them a research article about a specific uh, learning technique, a, a, a learning strategy. In this case, I use McDaniel and colleagues. This is all about practice testing. So like how practice testing is done, some different methods of doing it, sort of talking through the empirical evidence. So the students are asked to read this research article which for many of them, most of them is the first time they've ever read a research article. So they're scaffolding. Um, and then they write a short two to three page paper talking about the, um, they summarize the paper that they read, they talk about it and critique it, and then they apply it to themselves. They say, I could use this strategy in the following way. Um, one thing that's really important in the context of my class is that I have about 400 students in my intro psych class. So I already had an essay uh, assignment. This just replaced the existing essay assignment because I couldn't handle any more work. So this was instead of rather than on top of existing work. So then, you know, they, they read this paper, they write this essay, then there's more content, another exam, more content. Um, and then right before the final exam, I give them the end of semester survey. I say, okay, now you're ready for the final exam. How have you been studying all semester long? Like, what are your practices now? And then they go in and they take their final exam. So over the course of now five years or so, I've been collecting data um, longitudinally on this. And so I've now got some results and a couple of published papers um, to kind of talk about this. So the first takeaway is support for the prior research, right? So people who are using those high and moderate utility strategies do better on tests. Students who are using a lot of those low utility strategies not so much, right? They, they struggle, um, they're doing lots of, again, the rereading, the underlining, summarizing, copying their book, and they're just struggling. So again, yes, supports the previous research. Um, in terms of good news, right? I see that from the pre-test to the post-test, people get better at their study strategies. They are implementing more of the high and moderate utility strategies and us usually abandoning some of those lower utility strategies. Why? because they're not working. Um, something like 75 or 80% of my students are first year, first semester students. So there's, for the, a lot of them, that shock of starting college and not doing as well as they had expected based on high school. Um, I also compare across time, again, so that longitudinal piece. So looking at exam three and final exam at intervention, after I introduced the essay assignment, they do better, right? So all of a sudden, once they start learning about these better strategies, their exam scores start going up and it goes up substantially, something like, not like a huge, huge boost, but a substantial boost. So uh, something like three to four percentage points on those two exams. 
looking at the whole course grade, so compared to the control semester before I started implementing this new um, paper assignment, their course grades went up. So from an average of C plus to an average of B minus. Is this going to fix everything? No, of course not. No single intervention is gonna fix everything. But I don't know about you, but my students are very happy to see a half a letter grade improvement. And I'm happy to see that as well, especially since it was just a matter of subbing out one paper for another paper. Um, and importantly, there was a decreased proportion of D and F grades. So it seemed to float not all boats equally, right? The A students are going to get A's no matter what, but I tended to see a lot of elevation from the D and F students up into the C range, a couple of the C students move up into the B range. And so we really are getting better outcomes for the students who need it the most, the students who most are struggling with their learning strategies and course performance. Um, this probably is not going to be super surprising to a lot of people. Um, GPA matters, right? So people who are coming into college with a 3.9, 4.0 high school GPA, they do better in their college classes. They've usually developed more sophisticated and adaptive learning strategies, although that's not universal, and they tend to do better in college compared to people who struggled in high school. So, so that's super surprising. But one thing that I found was really interesting and useful is that there were a couple of study strategies that were especially beneficial regardless of GPA. So if you factor out GPA from the equation, it turns out self-explanation and practice testing are the most useful strategies that students can employ. So if we're, if you are anything like me and you find that your students are struggling, they're saying, uh, what do I do about this? We can target those specific, those two specific learning strategies because they are the most uniquely beneficial across the board. So self-explanation and practice testing is where it's at for my students. Um, in my references, when uh, you'll all have the slides here, I'll point you to some of the, um, there's an online repository of all my materials. You can feel free to take whatever appeals to you and whatever is helpful. But I also wanted to just point out a few additional resources for folks who are interested. Um, one thing that I love, I love the IPI lesson plan. So it's a, it's a lesson plan, improving study skills through psychological science. Um, there are slides, activities, uh, assessments, um, rub grading rubrics, there's all sorts of fantastic stuff. So if you are saying, I don't have the time to create all this stuff from scratch, you don't have to. It is a preset, beautiful plug and play lesson plan. You can dedicate you know, one class period, two class periods, less than one class period, whatever fits for your course context. But it's all in there and it's easy to just plug into your class. I've been using it for several years and it's, been, it's really, really helpful. Within that IPI lesson plan is um, one of the activities students can use is this video steer series by Stephen Chu called How to Get the Most Out of Studying. It's a five video series and so you can pick and choose. They're relatively independent from one another. Um, and so if you just want, if you're like, I have only five minutes to help my students learn about effective study strategies, have them watch a video or show a video in class. One of the videos that a lot of people use is called, I think it's called, I bombed the test, now what? Or something like that. So sometimes faculty will, or instructors will assign that for students who really struggled and then have some sort of assignment around it for students who really need that additional short little boost. Uh, last but not least, I want to give a shout out to Learning Scientist, which is this great um, website, learningscientist.org. It is run by a group of cognitive scientists who use psychological science to help build um, resources for teachers. There is student facing material. There are um, parent facing materials. It's very, very user friendly. Um, one of the things I really love are you can just print out bookmarks and give them out to your students. And each bookmark has a learning strategy on it. So if they just need a quick little reminder every time they open their textbook, give them a bookmark. So one of the things that I will just close in saying here um, is that sometimes the IPI, this Introductory Psychology Initiative, can seem really overwhelming because there's so much out there. And so what I want to emphasize is you don't have to do everything. If you do just one thing, these are all really quick and easy, small little things you can grab without having to completely redo your entire intro psych class. And there are my resources. 
Um, I will say, I know we're going to go to Q&A, but I want to give a shout out. Um, after our Q&A, Jen McCabe is going to expand on some of the, these ideas for improving learning strategies. So um, I kind of got the exciting piece to give a little bit of background, and she's going to expand a little bit more in her presentation as well. 